why am I here? One of the things that you have to do as a politician quite a lot is speak in front of an audience of people who know far more about the subject uh, than you do yourself. You have to be a bit of a generalist. Uh, and I'm, I'm very aware that there are probably people in this room who, whose knowledge about the kind of things I'm going to be talking about wildly outstrips my own knowledge. Um, so what I'm going to be talking about is some of the political principles uh, that interest me about the way the, the free software movement and the open source software movement uh, operate um, and some of the things that the public sector needs to learn, some of the things that government uh, needs to learn about uh, what the, the, the free and open source software movement has got to say. Um, I, I don't have, as I say, a great deal of technical knowledge. I, you know, I, I grew up, like a lot of people, with computers in the house. Um, but the first time I ever met a PC, and for a long time after I met my first PC, uh, I thought PCs equaled Windows. Uh, and I think many, many people uh, live a lot of their lives uh, thinking that. And it takes a long time uh, for many, many people to learn that PC doesn't equal Windows. Um, and that there are other options and that there are choices that they're being denied uh, if they don't uh, think outside of that, that kind of tight um, relationship. Um, I went away to university and I, 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 I did sign up for a computing course at university, but uh, it was the first of many courses that I managed to completely ignore while I was at uni, uh, so I learned very little about it there. Um, I started, uh, started eventually using computers at work, as most people do in various different offices, um, and eventually a friend of mine who had been using Linux for a long time started to nag me and nag me and nag me uh, that I should be looking beyond the, the computer systems I was using. It took him a long time to get me comfortable with the idea uh, and gently holding my hand through a migration process uh, on my home PC, uh, first of all a, a dual booting uh, system and then eventually realizing that I was using Windows less and less and less and I wouldn't really miss it if I freed up the disk space for it. So nowadays, I, I use uh, Linux at home, have done for quite a long time. And when I got elected to parliament, it was the first time that I'd worked in an institution that big with an IT system that controlled by somebody else. Uh, and I found it a daily frustration having to go back to, to using Windows just because I was aware of, of how much better the systems I was, I was using had become. Um, and so I started to think about why the public sector doesn't use these other systems, which are not always better, but are very often better. Um, and I started to think about some of the political principles involved. And as I did, I started to realize that uh, I had colleagues in, in other parties, not just um, uh, Green Party MSP, but not just Green Parties, but other parties, particularly elsewhere in Europe, countries like Germany, who had taken this thinking a lot further. Um, and some of the ideas that, that they talk about are the same ideas that the movement itself, the free and open source movement, talks about. Ideas like the comparison between the, the computer and the printing press, the idea that if, if when the printing press had been developed, uh, every single one had been owned and controlled by a single uh, monarch, or in the current analogy, that a single company had been controlling and owning uh, and deciding what everyone could, could use their computers for. That's the situation that we have if, if we allow a stranglehold by a single product like Windows. Um, but also other ideas like the power of cooperation. And the power of, of cooperation and concepts like the common good have fallen out of political language uh, in this country over recent years and recent decades. And the, the collaborative and cooperative process that's going on in the creation of free software uh, and other free systems. I mean, uh, Wikipedia is perhaps the best known now of the systems that, that create by a, a, an open process, a collaborative process. And it's become perhaps the, the single most important reference work on, on the web. If you, I, I'm always surprised by the number of MSP speeches where I, I recognize a turn of phrase or I recognize an argument. I think, I read that on Wikipedia last night. So MSP's researchers are using it and they're recognizing the value of it, and they're probably contributing to it and collaborating with it as well. Um, so it's about the, 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 the political aspects and, and what the public sector can learn from cooperation and collaboration, particularly in an age when a lot of people feel disconnected from politics and feel that they can't take part or that it's not, there's no point in them taking part and contributing to, to politics. Um, 
also some of the economic arguments, and, and the last speaker, was it, was it Chris, um, was talking uh, in answer to a couple of the questions about um, the jobs. And what we've got is a distributed system uh, in economic terms. Uh, it's not entirely centralised in, in, in terms of its, its, uh, where the ideas come from, but it's not centralised in terms of where the money goes either. Uh, it's a distributed system. And if that sort of system is going to take hold and, and become more prevalent uh, in the public sector, there's going to be an economic consequence and the public sector needs to take account of that. Um, there was also, when I was thinking about this, a, a parallel with social enterprises. And Scotland has got a long tradition of developing uh, concepts of, of social enterprise, like the cooperative movement, uh, but also nowadays the way these, these uh, organisations turn up new concepts like the idea of the triple bottom line, the idea of a company which is making a profit. It's not a charity, but it's, it's doing more than profit. It's not only got a single profit-based bottom line, but a social and an environmental uh, bottom line as well. And I think a movement like the free software movement and the companies and the communities and the, the, the individuals who, who are working in it and collaborating with it, they're doing more than just producing a product which will sell and which will make their name or make them money. They're doing something for other reasons. They have other bottom lines like a better product, like a way to, to cooperate and communicate with people around the world. Um, and I guess finally, as a, as a Green, as a, someone from an environmentalist party, there's, um, there's a, an environmental aspect to this. When I, I was quite surprised, actually, to, to see that when Vista was being launched, uh, Greenpeace were the first people I saw to put out press releases uh, saying what a problem wa this was. And I thought, Greenpeace, okay, well, what's that all about? And basically, the argument is making the best use of the hardware resources, uh, not just in this country, if, you know, you get Vista being adopted throughout the, the public sector, you're getting a lot of hardware that's going to be thrown out uh, because of that, uh, and probably onto landfill, probably not a very uh, environmentally friendly product to dispose of. Um, but also in developing countries where they simply don't have access to, you know, they, they don't have a, a budget for simply, well, we'll upgrade all our hardware this year because we've got a new, a new operating system. Free and open source uh, products can benefit developing countries where they don't have the, the money to spend on the hardware as well as the software. Um, so the, there was a, a number of, of different ideas bubbling away there about how government and the public sector need to take account of, uh, of what this movement's got to say. Not just the products that the free and open source movement creates, but what it's got to say as well uh, about uh, some of these political ideas. And, uh, and lo and behold, these, these ideas were immediately adopted by the rest of the party, and, and now we're using uh, Debian to run all our party office systems uh, around the corner uh, on Line Street. Um, not entirely without problem, it's got to be said, but people seem to be up for, for taking on those problems and, and trying to get around them and learn from them. So once I'd started thinking about these things as an MSP, I fired off a few written questions. One of the, one of the main tools that we've got is, is written parliamentary questions. We uh, fire off them, them by email and the, the executive has to come up with an answer, the ministers have to come up with some sort of answer. And they were fairly innocent sort of questions about how much the parliament and how much the executive is spending on things like Microsoft operating licenses, software licenses, how much uh, that's costing the taxpayer and what we're getting for it. It was just maybe half a dozen, I thought, fairly innocent little questions. And just days after I lodged those questions, long before I even got any reply, uh, I got an email from the country manager of Microsoft saying how great it would be if he could take me to dinner. Um, and, you know, I thought for a few seconds about what, what a nice dinner Microsoft might be able to afford. Um, but I didn't go to dinner. It, I, I didn't close down communication, though. I, what happened was I invited him around to my office for a cup of coffee at my expense, uh, and he was happy to do that. And, you know, I came away after that meeting uh, you know, he'd been talking about some of these ideas and how Microsoft was, you know, really very up for this exciting new change that the open source uh, software and the free software movement's got to tell us about. And I, I almost came away thinking, well, yeah, he's not so such a bad bloke, but, you know, he's being paid a great deal of money to persuade people like me that he's not such a bad bloke and that Microsoft is open to these ideas. Um, what's very clear is that if the public sector, clear to me anyway, that if the public sector continues to be utterly reliant, as it is at the moment, on a very small number of contracts with its hardware uh, and a very small number of companies for its software, it's not going to be getting the best value 
the taxpayers' money. And there's also aspects not just about buying in Windows or buying Dell PCs all the time. There's also aspects about the software that's created with taxpayers' money. When the public sector, when the NHS or the, the police or whoever else decide that they need some bespoke software produced, why on earth should the ownership of that, that software that's being produced not benefit the greatest number of people? Uh, and if that can be done best to making that free software, um, not necessarily um, you know, changing what it is, not necessarily uh, you know, taking any risks with, I mean, obviously some police systems, there's a, there's a very good reason, not a commercial reason, but a security reason why systems might need to be closed. But if there's no reason like that, then we should be as a default position, not just as an exceptional once in a while nice to do extra if there happens to be uh, you know, somebody in that, in that uh, government department who's interested, but it should be a default position that unless there's a, a, an overriding security reason not to make something open, it should be. We paid for it as taxpayers. We should be able to use it uh, in our own workplaces uh, and in our own uh, academic institutions to study it as well. Um, there, there's a huge problem with overcoming perceptions, and it's one that I'm sure you've, you've talked about earlier today, about what free software actually means. It's that it's not just uh, cost-free, that it's not just uh, you don't pay any money for it, but it means something about freedom uh, to use it, to learn from it, to study it, to share it. Um, there's a huge problem overcoming that perception when we're trying to persuade businesses and, and public sector organizations that they should adopt free software in their own work. But there's also a huge problem in trying to get over to politicians that it means something other than just cost-free. Um, we've, we've tried to, to explore that with, with MSPs. Uh, some MSPs get it. A few MPs get it as well. Um, and we also, I think, have a, a real job to do to try and persuade local councillors uh, who are responsible for the, the part of the public sector that delivers a hell of a lot of public services directly, which MSPs don't do. Um, we need to try and persuade them to be open-minded to this as well. Um, partly, as I say, in, in delivering their services, in running systems, partly in terms of education. I see no reason why uh, the principles of free software, the way that it works, uh, shouldn't be taught as part of the, the curriculum in every school and college where there's uh, uh, IT and, and computing being studied. I see no reason why any student who's uh, interested in computing should leave school without having had the opportunity to collaborate with other students around the world on free or open source projects. That seems to me like a, you know, so many different educational uh, aspirations can be achieved through that, not just the computing ones, but also the spirit of cooperation, as well as some sense of, of who the other people that we live on this world w with are and how to, how to cooperate with them, how to learn about them. I see no reason why that shouldn't be happening in every school. Um, how, to, how to take things forward then? It's, it's clear that Microsoft uh, is a big beast in this jungle and uh, can throw its weight around. It's got a lot of weight and a lot of money. Um, I don't know if you're aware, but last year the Microsoft Government Leaders Conference came to Edinburgh and much to my dismay, the whole Scottish Parliament was turned over to them uh, for a day and a half to run their what they, they, they were pleased to call the Government Leaders Conference. Um, what it turned into, I think, was a glorified uh, local or, or regional Vista launch, um, a product launch at the, the taxpayers' expense, giving them a, uh, the use, the, the free use of what I think is actually quite a nice building, uh, which we all paid a lot of money to build, um, and allowing them a platform, a very significant and high-profile platform, not just in terms of media profile and public profile, but high-profile in terms of other governments and politicians around Europe. A high-profile platform was given to them from which they could say, if you want to be a modern government, you need to buy Vista. If you want to be a government that's providing services in the 21st century, uh, you need to buy our products to do it with. And that was a, a shameless and a shallow sales pitch which we paid for, and uh, I, I did my best to try and persuade uh, the Parliament that we should allow at least one room to bring in a different group of people to talk about a different message or a different set of ideas. Uh, wasn't able to do it at the time. Would love to try and do something in future. I would love to try and organize some kind of briefing event for MSPs uh, and for civil servants, people delivering services, procuring uh, IT systems that brings in some expertise from 
from you and your colleagues, from the, the businesses who are working in open source and free software, the communities, the academics who are working in it, and the individuals. And if, if any of you have ideas to help me take that forward, I'd love to hear uh, from you. And that's all I've got to say, so if there are any questions, I'll do my best to, to have a go at them. Hi, it was going back to what you were saying about um, teaching children in schools about open source software. Um, and I'm an ex-teacher myself, which can be a notoriously technophobic profession, as you may or may not know. Um, and I do sometimes pass the time reading old GCSE syllabuses. And the current computer science syllabus, I think it's QCA, has um, pupils need to know that software cannot be copied. And I'd, I'd highlight the cannot. They need to learn about the work of FAST. And there is absolutely no mention of open source or free software whatsoever in any GCSE computer science syllabus that I've ever seen. I just wanted, you know, talk, going back to what you were saying about you know, trying to get people over the hurdles, getting them into it and everything, and um, just what you think about that. Yeah, well, if you were paranoid, you know, <laughs> you, no. might, you might think this is some kind of um, appalling conspiracy against... I try not to be paranoid. I try not to be paranoid, but it's very clear that there are some, there's some basic ideas, uh, not just about um, what, the, what the, the, the legal situation is around uh, public licenses and, and the, the, the kind of technical aspects of that, but just around the, the spirit of cooperation and sharing. I mean, why on earth should we be teaching children that they're not allowed to share the toys, you know? Um, I, I, I remember um, seeing a, a lecture, was it Richard Stallman? Um, and he, he, tells this, he tells this story about the first time he was told he wasn't allowed to share with his colleagues in the next room uh, when they, I think he was trying to figure out how to make a printer driver work or something. And he wasn't allowed to tell. He was allowed to know, but he wasn't allowed to tell. He wasn't allowed to share with his colleagues how to do something. And why on earth should we be teaching children that it's wrong to share? Um, that's, that's how basic this is. And if we're saying to, to children that the only way software can be created is if, uh, is if I lease it to you, but I still own it, um, and I can still tell you what you're allowed to do with it and what you're not allowed to do with it, I think that's, that's profoundly dis depressing. And you know, I, I, it also relates to a lot else that's happening in um, the concepts about intellectual property in academic research as well. And, I, I was at a, a conference down south um, just at the weekend where guys from Imperial College were talking about, and they, they were very proudly displaying on a uh, projector the, their, their ideas about how they do open research and how they're applying some of the same principles uh, from open source and, and free software to academic research and intellectual property. And you know, when you see it, when you see these principles just spelled out in black and white and compared with how we do things at the moment in a, uh, a quite a narrow, individualistic, materialistic uh, kind of society. You just see it in black and white and it makes perfect sense that this is, this is what we should be doing. This should be the default. Um, I saw a hand there and then over there. Do you wanna? Hi, um, I know that there's a, there's a UK based website called uh, They Work For You, which mm -hmm. is aimed to make Parliament more accessible. Um, and has sort of linked with the open source community and uh, built on open source tools. Uh, I wondered, uh, I was just wondering what sort of profile that has uh, within, within government and parliamentary uh, members and, uh, and whether that's helping to raise the profile of open source at all or, or whether they're seen as some, some quite disconnected, two quite disconnected things. I wouldn't say it's raised the profile of open source. Um, we are aware of it. Uh, a lot of the time we hate these things because they just bombard us with emails which we then got to answer. Uh, but we should hate it. Um, you know, if, if we're really going to be accessible to, to the, the people that we represent, we should get bombarded with email, emails. And it is a wee bit annoying sometimes, but uh, that's just the job that we've signed up for. Um, the, the, there are opportunities, I think, to apply the same kind of principles uh, to public policy and how politicians engage with, uh, with the public. Um, and I mean, I, I don't know all the answers about how this should work. I think what we're, what we're at at the moment in, in terms of the development of democracy is, is quite, a, um, quite a, a difficult stage. I think um, 
when political parties had mass movements and their job was to get the vote out, it was very, very simple and direct relationship with the, the people they represented. Now we have this crash in involvement and participation, um, not just in voting, but in membership of political parties uh, and in faith in politics. Um, if we can apply some of these participative ideas, um, that means sometimes us not saying, this is my policy and so that's what I'm going to do. It means sometimes being a bit less precious about your own uh, politics and your own policy. Not abandoning that, but being willing to, to create ideas with other people rather than simply saying that you've got all the answers. And it also means the public and the media not blaming politicians for changing their mind or for not having all the answers. Um, so if, if politics is going to become some kind of um, participative uh, process in the same way that the... the so I know we're getting a wee bit off topic here, but um, if politics is going to become a participative process in the same way and create uh, public policy in, a, in the same way that, that free software is created, uh, I think that's a, a, a very exciting idea. It's one that I don't know how we make it happen. S schemes like the, the, the so sites like the uh, They Work For Us and, and a number of others are part of that, uh, but they're not the whole of it. And I think we need to um, think again about how we uh, create uh, space for, for debate in, in, in public. There have been a couple of open source political parties that have been attempted, um, where people actually want to create the manifesto purely online as a, as a, as a, a, a collaborative project. And the party begins with no policy at all. Um, it tends to kind of fall apart because you're bringing together people with, with no actual predefined common ground, no idea of, of where they want to go, and um, th there needs to be some kind of objective that's set somehow. But, well, I, th I think it's, it's interesting and, and, and worthwhile stuff to explore. The think tank Demos, a couple of years ago, published something about applying open systems to uh, the media uh, review process. We've, we've got um, media press complaints commission, we've got you know, a range of different bodies to which we're allowed to complain about the media. Um, but if you had a, an open source system for that, uh, if you had a, a kind of wiki style or, or collaborative and participative process for that, uh, you could have a much more responsive uh, public engagement with the media. If we could do the same thing with politics, uh, I think that would be um, quite a profound thing. Um, there was a question from down here, and then there's a lot of hands up at the back. So there's one here. It's kind of me again, because I've been to the war. <laughs> I've been out there, and we have done a lot of promoting free software since 2001. We have met every obstacle that you described correctly. But we have done one more thing, or two, maybe. One is that we have installed free software mm -hmm. on schools. When you have an installed base, you can ask new questions that you couldn't ask before. Before it was kind of, you should do free software. Now it's, we have all these kind of installed machines. And they, pupils are kind of not getting access to public information. It's like what we use as an example, as the Ministry of Reform, the minister herself used as an example. It has been a surrealistic situation where people are going to use public parking lots and they can just park there with cars from one manufacturer. You can't, because the computing language is so difficult, we need good, sane examples, showing the surrealistic examples, as I just told you. The other thing that has happened a couple of years ago was the national exams. That was, you needed to use Excel spreadsheet from Microsoft and Microsoft Excel to prepare national exams in math. Then we asked the question, why should we be a Microsoft customer because we're using Linux? Then a lot of people said, just ch change the operating system. This went up to the Minister of Education and she said, competition. It took one day after this was announced in a newspaper because we wrote a letter for six months earlier complaining. Mm -hmm. Then they begged on us on the knees never to go to the newspaper again because they will do everything we told them to. 
So we are kind of partners now of the educational directorate that does the preparation of national exams. So it should support Linux or not, if they're not doing it, they're out of business. And we put this company that delivered Excel spreadsheet out of business. This is how we should perform. We should make, uh, uh, ma use regular reason, good arguments, hard work, and we will prevail. This is good examples on the government can take part in any single company's business, but should provide everyone. It's about universal design, universal access, especially in schools, and it works. Yeah, I, th I think you're, you're absolutely right. With the, the, certainly the first point you make uh, about get these systems installed, get, get them out there, get people uh, using them in order to start asking questions and, and figure out how much they don't know about them um, is, is absolutely, you know, the, the first step. And I, I'm, I was working a, a couple of years ago with someone who uh, was trying to persuade public libraries to start distributing um, burned copies of, of open office uh, for, for nothing. Just, you know, he was, he was going to give them you know, hundreds of copies of, of this thing, just so long as they would be willing to, to be a, a source for people to, to access it. Um, and if we if we can do if we can jump on every opportunity to get these systems out there, that's and, top one. And this is my point: get it installed. Mm -hmm. My other point is then you will get into all kinds of trouble. You will, I mm -hmm. promise you that. But then they need to explain themselves why they're giving you headache, mm -hmm. and that's also a problem for yeah. them. Getting so in trouble can be very yeah. creative we sometimes. Um, there was a, a few hands at the back there. Um, uh, just first to answer the teacher's comment uh, at the front there. I've just sat uh, higher computing and it doesn't get any better with the higher. <laughs> so uh, I think I probably failed it because I answered the right way and not the <laughs> way they wanted me to. Uh, but also you said you'd uh, you'd like the MSPs to get involved if they can. Um, well, I'm part of the Edinburgh Linux user group and there's a few others of us here today. Um, and if you'd like to set up a meeting or something, we'd be quite happy to come down to the parliament and have a chat with you, uh, if that's something you'd be interested in. Absolutely, thanks very much. Um, I don't have cards with me, but if you, I'm sure you can I'll find I'll find you at the end, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, just drop me an email, that'd be great. Okay, will do. Hi, recently uh, there was the Scottish elections, which were all e-counted. I was actually doing through the proprietary system with closed source code. I was just wondering what you could do to stop spending a small fortune with this company DRS and try and use open systems insofar as we actually need computers to count. Uh, I, I don't think we need computers to have an open system for that. I think we need people uh, at desks with piles of paper counting them physically. Um, <laughs> the, I think there's a number of areas where um, people just jump towards a, a, a technical solution, uh, sometimes simply because they can't think of anything else to spend the money on, which is really sad. Um, we've got a very expensive system that we don't need. Uh, it actually took longer to count the, to count the votes, even in the, the, the stations where the systems were working smoothly. It took longer to count them uh, than by hand. And there's no evidence that it's a, a, a higher degree of accuracy, even when they when they work smoothly. And as we've seen, some of them work uh, very badly indeed. Um, so we, we should just junk them. Thank you. Hi. Um, did your did your questions um, to Parliament uh, involve asking how much uh, open or free software was currently in use? Because I think organisations can often underestimate how much. Um, uh, software of this type they're, they're using and when they do realize uh, what's already installed and working very well for them that sort of brings people together to uh, increase that usage. Uh, I didn't ask that specifically I asked about uh, what the executive's policy was and also the, the corporate body the, the corporate body is the, the body that runs Parliament as, a, as an institution uh, the executive being the, the, the devolved government uh, I asked what each what each body uh, has as, as policy in relation to uh, free and open source software as opposed to proprietary systems. I asked what they spend on uh, software licenses and um, there, was, there was another set of questions. I should have looked this up before I came, shouldn't I? Um, uh, I didn't get particularly useful information back again and I suspect if I had asked 
uh, how much is out there, uh, I would have got a stock answer like this information is not held centrally. But I could maybe give it a go. Right, thanks. Was there somebody else? There was certainly somebody this side, I think. Oh, right, okay. using Wikipedia for policy decisions. I find that rather disturbing. But yeah, I was wondering, surely the easiest thing to say is money talks. So why not say, look, we can save this amount, we could put it towards hospitals, blah, blah, blah. That, surely a couple of high profile headlines and papers would get uh, the ball rolling quite nicely. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess the, the downside of that or the danger with that is, is that you end up with, um, you know, I mean, the, the, the cost of the parliament building, for example, spiraled way out of control, but the original estimate was an estimate for a completely different building. Yeah. Um, if you start off by saying we're going to save this much money, but you end up um, only applying free software in some circumstances and not others, or uh, you don't account for the, the running costs and the management costs or whatever. I mean, I, 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 I think that you can get better just raw value for money uh, a lot of the time with, with free or, or open source software. But that's not the overriding reason for me why we should be using it. Uh, I think the, 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 the freedom is, is more important than the freeness. Um, and um, I, 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 think it, I think we've got to win that argument before we're going to persuade people that they should adopt it. Um, yeah, a couple here. Um, in in the state of Massachusetts in the U.S., they passed a law, um, I want to say a year or two ago, about using open document uh, format for their documents for government purposes. And recently some states in the U.S. have also tried to pass similar bills. Is the Scottish Parliament having anything like that that's similar? Or? Uh, the situation's got better in the last few years. Uh, it used to be that there were a lot of, um, uh, you know, uh, quite a few um, uh, documents would be put out in, in say, quite complex Word documents that didn't display properly in, in other packages and so on. That's, that's got better. Uh, I wouldn't say that they're perfect, but uh, there's, there's less of that now than there was. Okay. Um, I've been told that I should be winding up in some amount of time. I couldn't quite see the number. 15 minutes? All oh, right, okay. Thank we're, you. We're okay, we're okay. Uh, there was a question behind there. How much do you think it's about uh, end user education, like the MPs that you work with and people in Parliament, it just, as soon as you say open source, it's just an alien concept mm -hmm. to them. An example being that um, I did a presentation to uh, a Scottish uh, section of the government for a new website and we said we'd do it in an open source content management system that's mm -hmm. very popular and ticked all the boxes. Um, and they were just scared off by the fact that it was open source and eventually they went down the other route of proprietary software where I thought, you know, that's my taxpayer's money. I'd rather it be spent on open source. Um, absolutely. Um, that shouldn't have happened even in terms of current policy. Current government policy does allow uh, open source uh, products to be considered on an equal basis. And um, I think a, a lot of the time what you get is, as you say, a, a kind of instinctive recoil um, simply out of don't know what that means, not familiar with it, you know, go, go back to something that, that's kind of familiar and safe. Um, I think having people use, even just a browser, even just um, people use on a daily basis a different browser and learn that uh, browsing the internet does not equal using Internet Explorer. Um, just having people see that, uh, that a, soft, a piece of software that they're gonna use on a daily basis is reliable, <laughs> is often better, uh, is, is no more confusing or puzzling or difficult. Um, getting people to, into that daily habit and, and seeing that it is, uh, it's real software, it really works, um, and it's not scary. Um, if, we can, if we can do that, and again, as, as the, the colleague down at the front here said, it's just about getting stuff installed. Uh, and if, if even we could get schools to install uh, two or three different browsers uh, and, and discuss what it means to use them differently and, and why they're different, uh, that would be a start. Uh, there was a hand up at the back there, and then down here. Perhaps you or someone else can give me m some more information, but as I was looking, I saw that there was a university consortium
in this area of the world that made an advanced study and the conclusion was that Microsoft has 75,000 programmers and if they just put those 75,000 programmers in a catch-up mode trying to uh, duplicate what Linux now has, it would take them eight years just to get to where it, we are in 2007. Uh, I would like to know more details about that. I'm sure that that would probably help to have a free open source software day at the parliament. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think having that kind of event in parliament would, would certainly help. I'm not familiar with the, the research that you're, you're talking about there, but I can, I can, I can readily believe it. And I think it's a, an indicator of the power of uh, collaboration and cooperation uh, that, you know, that, that would not have been the expectation when people started talking about, uh, I want to, um, you know, create a, a completely different uh, operating system from scratch and it's not going to be based on anybody making money. Um, I think people would have said, you'll never do that. That'll take you, you know, take you decades just to get started. Um, and what we've, what we've got now is a situation that's turned those expectations on their head. Um, uh, another, uh, there was one down here, I think. Um, I, the company that I work for, we've actually gone in for tenders for um, government business and so on, and indeed we've won quite a few. There was the, the GLA, London Elect site and that kind of thing, which there were lots and lots of consortia, most of them uh, based on proprietary software, which uh, were tendering and we won the tender because we happened to bring a good guy who answered all the questions well. But it is an uphill struggle because if I'm being frank, of all the sectors that I meet, people involved in computing and IT, the most kind of conservative and, dare I say it, frankly, just unintelligent are in government and quasi-government organizations. Uh, I guess it's because no self-respecting geek thinks that he wants to go and work for a local council or something. <laughs> so I have to warn you that the dross that you meet is, 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 I mean, it sounds humorous, but actually that's a big problem. You're not getting that many good quality people in your government IT infrastructure and their conservatism and their fear is what keeps them going back to daddy basically mm -hmm. and uh, frankly until that changes I don't think you're going to get the changes that you want. Uh, you may be right, um, I'd like to point out at this point I'm not in government. Um, <laughs> yeah. uh, I, you're, you're probably using stronger language than I would. I think the, there are some people that I've met uh, who are working in the public sector and also in the voluntary sector providing public services uh, who are more open to innovation. Um, and as more public services are being provided by the voluntary sector, uh, by smaller organizations, by uh, different kinds of people who are drawn from different uh, experience, different backgrounds and so on, uh, I hope that there'll be more openness to, to innovation. So I think we've got to try and, try and get the, the, the best outcome that we can rather than say that that we can't do anything and you're correct about I think the voluntary sector is actually very different mm. from the kind of the staid yeah. let's go and use EDS and Microsoft sort of people because of course they can't yeah. they have to say we are actually using the money we've received from the charity or whatever responsibly and they're, they're beginning to get that point absolutely absolutely and and as I say more uh, public services are being delivered now and are going to be delivered in the future through the voluntary sector through uh, organizations which which perhaps don't carry that, that kind of civil service culture or civil service mentality. So maybe that's an opportunity. Uh, any more questions? One up at the back there. Uh, <clears throat> you were arguing that um software that's paid for by the taxpayers should be open to use by the taxpayers, and that's, that's fine. But there's a parallel argument about um, other types of information that's produced um, by the taxpayers' money. Uh, for instance, maps or weather data or various kinds of statistics that's gathered by the government. Um, in the US, there is um, normally data that is produced by the government is not covered by copyright. I'm not sure what the state is in the UK or Scotland, but normally in Europe, you don't have that type of legislation. So what are your thoughts on that? 
Um, it does vary uh, from different parts of the public sector, different parts of different levels of government as well. I've come up against this, a similar problem with, with maps uh, myself, and political parties do. Uh, political parties like to have maps of the areas that they want to canvas, uh, so that the, you know, the, the door knocking and the canvassing can, can be um, up to date and that you take account of, of changes. Um, and sometimes you, f you find that, uh, yes, you're allowed to have the map, but you're not allowed to use it for X, Y, or Z purposes. Um, so you have, to, you have to go in saying, I'm going to use it for something else completely. Um, that's very, you know, a, a, a kind of silly example. It's the sort of thing that simply shouldn't happen. But um, it, it does vary from, from different, uh, different levels of government. The Scottish Parliament, I, I noticed uh, just uh, about a week, 10 days ago, announced that it was uh, having a consultation on its copyright policy. Um, and uh, hopefully I'll be able to, to try and uh, nudge them in, in the right direction in terms of information that, that Parliament produces. Um, not just the, I mean, the, the official records of parliamentary business are all public, um, but uh, there, are, there are constraints over, the yellow one says five minutes, I think. Um, there are constraints over, well, sorry about that. There are constraints over what we're allowed to use the video. You can, you can get the streaming video from parliamentary business on the Parliament website. Um, if you use um, Linux, you can download it pretty easily. If you use Windows, you can't, which is nice. Uh, or at least I haven't found a Windows program that will do it. Um, there probably is one out there, isn't there? Um, but there are constraints over what you're allowed to use that, um, that video for. And th there shouldn't be those kind of constraints. I should be able to use video of myself saying, making speeches in the, in the chamber for pretty much any reason, any purpose. I can't think of any reason to restrain that at all. And people should be allowed to, to copy and, and share that, that information as well because it's, uh, it's public debate and it should be public record. Hello. I remember, if I remember rightly from the last election, the Greens have policies on um, community-led government, and I was wondering to what extent your experience of community-led Linux has shaped those policies. Uh, I think there is a strong parallel. Uh, I think, um, for me, uh, one of the things that the free software movement represents is um, a something which couldn't have been created by, by a political movement. It couldn't have been created for a political purpose and, and someone design a movement like that and say this is what it's going to achieve. It, it, it grew kind of um, organically, it grew from, from individuals. But it, it somewhere sits between uh, the, the, the slightly kind of left libertarian ideas that, that do uh, sit in the, in the Green Party's tradition, but also the individualist uh, tradition, which um, at the moment is is kind of co-opted by the political right, um, the a, a co collaborative process is very much about uh, it's not a, not about a, a, a corporate source and a corporate set of controls about what what a product can be used for. It's about what individuals can contribute, what they can get out of it. But it's it's not about individual ownership and possession and uh, the kind of materialistic individualism which has characterised politics in the last twenty or thirty years in this country certainly. Um, so it, it kind of sits somewhere between the, 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 the left and the right concepts of, of individualism and, and individual libertarianism, for me, personally. Yeah. Does that make any sense, or am I rambling? Okay. Um, I think there's probably about time for one more question. Um, we're running out of time, but there's one at the back there. Yeah, I was wondering if you could make a start by hiring researchers who are friendly to the cause rather than simply hiring people that have been in the party for the longest amount of time or have contributed the most money or whatever you know um very few people have contributed very much to the green party at all but that's one of our problems um <laughs> we, we we do uh, for all of our um paid positions we do publicly advertise um and one of the things that I've found really valuable about that is that we do bring in uh, new people who end up volunteering for the party after they started working for us as, in the parliamentary group. Um, there's a range, to be honest. I mean, some MSPs will hire their, their, their husband or their wife or their son or their brother or whatever. Uh, others are much more uh, kind of equal ops about the whole thing and, and do a full public <laughs> recruitment process. Um, it's, it's possible that a, a new set of rules will come in about that because the, 
Uh, the Parliament wants to act as the employer for MSPs staff, even though MSPs would recruit, the, the Parliament would be the employer and it would uh, make sure that they, uh, they got treated a lot better. Some, some researchers get treated pretty badly by their employers. Um, if that was to happen, then you might have a, a, a single policy on, on recruitment processes. But uh, politicians, like anybody else, there are a range, the, the broad range of people, some of them uh, very hardworking, very disciplined, and very uh, committed to, to their principles, and others maybe less so. It's, it's just a group of human beings like any other group at the end of the day. Um, listen, I, I hope some of this has been uh, vaguely interesting. It's probably been a bit different from what you've been hearing for the rest of the day. I hope it's been relevant to what you've been hearing uh, in the rest of the day. And if you do want to get in touch and help me uh, take forward my thoughts about how, uh, how we try and influence government, how we try and influence the wider public sector um, to be a little better on this. And we're right on, the, right on the button with the red piece of paper saying time up, so that's very good. Uh, thanks very much for your questions and, and for, for your time.